Dr. TJ Higgins, um, who's a CSO honorary fellow. I guess TJ would be one way of, would be a good way of describing you. Thanks. So TJ's had a very um, eminent career. He's, he's originally from Ireland and he's very good at dancing, I'd have to say, which I know from first-hand experience. His first degrees were in agricultural science from the University, National University of Ireland, and then he got his PhD from University of California, Davis. Um, he then came to, as a postdoc fellow at ANU, and, and I'd have to say, TJ, I did it the other way around. I did my PhD at the ANU and did postdoc at UC. So uh, um, shortly after, he joined CSRO Plant Industry, where he remained for many years and arose eventually to be the uh, Chief Research Scientist and Deputy Chief of Plant Industry. And he retired, I think, I'm not sure when, TJ, four or five years ago? Yeah, ten years ago. Ten years ago, oh my God. <laughs> but he's, it, it's been a very active retirement. And one of TJ's great passions was to improve plants for um, using gene technology for food security. And he's done some wonderful work in Africa, uh, particularly protecting uh, plants against insect attack and improving their nutritional quality. And he's going to talk today about biotechnology for food security in Africa. So I'll pass over to TJ. And while I do that, uh, Elvira will mute everybody. Um, you can ask questions via the chat box, and if you press your space bar, you can also be heard. Okay, so over to you, TJ. Thank you very much, Joanne, again, for this, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to the, the fellowship here in the ACT and to other guests as well. Now, I'm going to just start off by explaining a little bit why the title is a bit a little bit grandiose, more than a bit grandiose, because food security relies, amongst many other things, on, on uh, good crop genetics and good agricultural practices. And, and the focus today is going to be on crop improvement through genetics and plant breeding. But I am very aware that food security does rely on many other things, but I'm, I'm just not going to go into those. But poverty is what certainly one of the very major things that uh, is in the background, but I'm not going to talk about that today, except to just remind you that most of the countries that we're working in are uh, in extreme poverty, particularly in Nigeria, I would say. So from well before Mendel, people were improving crops. In, improving crops for probably 12 to 15,000 years. Um, and even before Mendel, probably a couple of hundred years before Mendel, people were already figuring out how to improve plants by not just by selection, but by doing plant breeding, making crosses. And in this picture, there is a, a little guide here as to what's happened to uh, crop uh, and plant breeding over the last um, 150 years or so, when crossbreeding started, and this was followed by hybrid breeding in the 20s, tissue culture, and getting up into more recent times, the gene technology, which is the, the form of biotechnology that I'm going to be talking about today, started in probably the first crops that were released that uh, were developed using gene technology were released in the in the 90s, mid 90s. But there have been other advances, other advances in crop breeding uh, as well uh, since then too. I'm just having a bit of trouble getting my slides to go forward. So plant breeders have access to many tools. Um, selection, of course, was what people did mostly in the beginning, but and then this was followed by crossing and selection. They can use interspecific crosses, you know, crossing between species. They can make crosses even between genera. They can use uh, chemical mutagenesis and muti uh, nuclear mutagenesis. They can make hybrids. They can use double haploids. They can use molecular markers. Enhanced statistical techniques. They can use genetic engineering, which is the main topic of today's uh, talk, but they can also use gene editing. So there are many ways in which plant breeders can go about crop 
improvement. And I'm just going to talk about one part of it, which is genetic engineering or genetic, genetic modification. And the crop that I'm going to pick on is, is an African crop. It's, they're called cowpeas or black eyed peas, as you can see here from the image. Uh, and this is a crop that's very important, particularly in West Africa, but throughout Africa, really. Many countries in Africa use this as a protein source. Other starchy crops like uh, maize, uh, sorghum provide much of the starch. Cassava, of course, as well, provide much of the starch in the diet, but cowpeas and other legumes provide the, the protein. And this is, uh, I just want to mention the cowpea breeders that I interact with in West Africa. This is J.B. Dinegre from, from Burkina Faso. Uh, this is IDK Ectople. Many of these people seem to use their initials. It seems to be a thing about these people who work on cowpeas. This is uh, IDK is from Ghana. And this is uh, Mohammed Ishiaku. The these are all national breeders for cowpeas in their respective countries. Mohammed for Nigeria, IDK for Ghana, and and JB for Burkina Faso. And these are people that I've interacted with very closely over the last uh, 15 years, really, in this, in this project. Now, just going back to use cereal meals as a, as a surrogate, I might say, for what's happened to crop improvement in the world versus Africa. And on the top there, you can see on the left-hand side, y-axis is tons per hectare, up, going up to four and a half tons or so. Uh, and on the x-axis, we're looking at 1960 to 2020. And you can see that yield cereal yields, which are really the major sources of calories for feeding humans, have increased from about one and a half tons up to about four tons per hectare over that period of time. Whereas in Africa, and the darker blue, the lower line, that, that increase has been much less. It has increased from about one ton per hectare up to about one and a half ton. And this is this is a major reason why there is there are food security issues in Africa. There are food security issues, of course, around the world, but in Africa, it's particularly bad. And this is one of the reasons why I, I have been interested in this area. Of for, for a long time. I don't, I'm not working on cereals. We, we work on, on, on the cowpea that I mentioned earlier, the black eyed pea. It's one of the vignas. It's a food legume or a pulse, as they're often called. And, and this crop was domesticated in Africa. It, it is an African crop. It's domesticated probably four or 5,000 years ago. Uh, it, it is a, a high protein grain, as I said, it's, the protein is about 25 to 30 percent protein in the grain. Uh, it has a good quality starch as well, low glycemic index starch. Um, global production is about 10 million tons, and most of that being produced in West Africa, Nigeria, Niger particularly, but also uh, to a lesser extent in Burkina Faso and, and Ghana. The, it, of course, fixes nitrogen, like all the other legumes, and there is a high feed value in the stubble as well, like, like most legumes, because many of these smallholder farmers, and the, I might say that these farmers have uh, very small acreages or hectares, about one to one, one and a half hectares is the average size. But despite these benefits, there are problems, of course, too. Pests and diseases are major problems. Now, as I said, it's a crop of smallholder farmers, and usually it's intercropped with, with tall crops like sorghum, as is shown here. You can barely see the cowpeas here. They're largely on the ground and then grow up the, uh, the, the, the sorghum plant. Uh, and the, agri the agriculture and the mechanizations are very different to what they are elsewhere in the world, particularly here you know, compared to, to Australia. This is a, a farmer from the northern part of, of Nigeria uh, talking about his uh, 
interest in cowpeas. He says, in fact, it's his livelihood. Um, and one of the challenges that he faces, as mentioned there, is a cowpea bloodborne. It's one of the insect pests. There are several insect pests, but this is one of the serious ones. And he, he, these days, is starting to spray the crop because the yields are so low. He sprays up to seven times in the season. <clears throat> and the reason is it is because the bugger, this is a, a lepidopteran insect pest, and the moth lays eggs on the young flower bud, and the larvae begin their growth in, in the flowers. And then they move on to the pods, and they live on the pods and, and in the pods and on the seed. And yield losses can be uh, often exceed 50%, and sometimes can be much higher than that, sometimes lower, of course, varies from, from year to year. But the farmers in Nigeria consider this to be one of their major problems. Now, insecticide use has started to increase in Africa. It didn't when I started work there, probably 15 years ago or so, and there were very little use of insecticides, but they are now used. But they are, it's very informal. The insecticides are bought in largely from China because of prices, and the labels are not very, um, not very clear. And uh, the farmers don't like spraying them uh, at, at all. If they can avoid it, they would. So the options that they have is not to control the insects at all and rely on the seed's natural resistance. And there is very little natural resistance in the seeds, and there's been a lot of work on the germplasm. There's a huge supply of germplasm at uh, the International Center, the CG Center in Ibadan in Nigeria, where they have 16,000 accessions. And these have been screened for resistance to this particular pest, and there isn't basically any natural resistance. And yield without spraying is about 350 kilos per hectare, very low yield. If they use insecticides, on the other hand, there, there is, uh, they can yield almost two tons. So you can see that there that insects are a major problem. We came into this with, a, with the question as to whether or not we could use biotechnology, that is gen genetic engineering in this, in, our, in this case, to introduce inbuilt resistance. And we were hoping that we might be able to increase yield not to 1.7 tons, because there are other insect pests other than this one that you can see here. This is the, the pod borer, Maruca vitrata, shown here on the right-hand side. And we were hoping that we might be able to increase yields uh, maybe by 20% by or so, or maybe a bit more. We didn't know what that would be. So we set about using gene technology or genetic engineering or genetic modification, as it's frequently called, as to, to, to try to introduce this inbuilt resistance. A bit like has been done for cotton in Australia. And we use that pretty much as our model, really. So what we had to do starting out was to develop a gene transfer system for cowpea, that is to be able to get DNA into cowpea. We then had to reconstruct genes into a plant format so that they would work in, in the cowpea, in, in the plant. Uh, and then transfer those genes into Calpi using the gene transfer system mentioned above in, in one, and then uh, do molecular analyses on those transgenics uh, with the new genes, uh, field tests, uh, and to select out a line that the breeders could use in Africa, and then do the breeding of, of, in, of new varieties. The breeding of the new varieties would be all done in, in Africa. So the genetic transformation system that we use for gene transfer into cowpea is, is very standard these days. It's been in use for maybe 40 years now. It's based on a soil bacterium called Agrobacterium plumopacium, and we use a DNA plasmid vector for gene delivery, and we use uh, antibiotic selection to select out those cells that have taken up the new DNA, in this case, we're using uh, neomycin phosphotransferase 2 and the antibiotic geneticin. And we use parts of the plant from the embryo of imbibed mature seed, as I'll show you uh, shortly. So we, in, in the cowpea transformation, we start off with 
a mature seed like this, and then they're imbibed overnight in water, and the seeds are divided in half and incubated with the agrobacterium containing the, the new gene. And then they go through a process of tissue culture in the presence of amino acids and sugars and other agents to allow us to um, make basically new plants. They, they don't look very much like plants here in D, but they do. Uh, after four, four to five months, start to look like plants, and they do, they do. do we can uh, develop roots on them, put them into soil, and transfer them into the greenhouse where they will flower and produce pods. And those the seeds in those pods behave just like normal puppies. Uh, this is a, a very brief diagram of the binary plasmid that we use to introduce the two genes. This is the, the, the antibiotic selectable marker gene here, MPT shown on the left-hand side, and the BT gene called crystal cell gene 1AB. And both of these genes have been, have, have been reconstructed so that they are plant-like. Both of these genes come from microbes, but, and if they were transferred directly into plants, they wouldn't work, but they have been, the DNA sequences have been changed and rearranged so that they will uh, work in plants. And the DNA between this left border and this right border is what is transferred into the plant, into the plant chromosome. I'm not going to go into more detail than that, except to say that we do that gene transfer and then we screen that the transgenic plants that we make in the lab, we screen them in the lab and in the glass house. We look, of course, for high levels of expression, particularly in the, in the flowers, because that's the, the target for these larvae, it's shown here, the Maruka larvae is shown there. And we look for single copies of the transgene, and no plasma vector backbone sequences. We, of course, make them homozygous so that the genes are in both chromosomes. And we look for good phenotype in the glass house and eventually in the field. And we do laboratory bioassays here in Australia using the larvae before we send anything to, to Africa. So those are the steps that we go through. These steps take quite a bit of time. Many of these steps are a requirement of the regulatory system, such as no, no plasma vector backbone sequences. These are things that we have to do to satisfy the regulators. Uh, and when we have done uh, ticked all of those boxes, we then take these seeds to uh, West Africa, to the northern part of Nigeria, here to the southwestern part of Burkina Faso, and to the northern part of Ghana, where we have been doing field trials since about 2009 with the colleagues that I mentioned earlier. These field trials are typical. They're replicated field trials with border rows shown here around them. And there's a uh, six uh, independent transgenic lines shown here with different colors, and the parent line, the non transgenic parent line that we use uh, to transform. And there, as I said, this is a typical field, replicated field trial, as we do for any other crop, uh, with perhaps more border rows than you might have you know, under normal circumstances. These trials are, are subject to biosafety laws in each of the countries. And these countries do have biosafety laws that are very similar to the laws that are here in Australia or elsewhere around the world. In fact, uh, the laws in Nigeria were pretty much based on the, the OGTR and the SAMS rules here. And the Crawford Fund that was instrumental in helping train some of the, the regulators from Nigeria in the, in the very beginning, <clears throat> which, which I was very, very grateful, I would say. These trials are, uh, of course, conducted in the same way as trials are here, pretty much. They're on the 24 7 uh, guard, uh, and uh, the rules are, as I said, very similar to what we have here in Australia. I'm not going to go through all of the details, but just a couple of points that I'd like to make. And one of the things that, of course, we have to convince the breeders that there's no yield drag associated with the trans shield in the field. Breeders often are, are, when they have resistance to a particular pest or disease, often 
there is often a yield drag associated with that resistance. So one of the things that we had to convince the breeders is that there was no yield drag. So here on the left-hand side on the y-axis is yield, in this case, yield of seed per grams of seed per plant. And this is the non-transgenic line, the parent line that doesn't have the trans gene in it, doesn't have the BT gene. And here are two lines out of about 30 that we've tested in the field. Uh, this line 709 and 252B are two lines that have performed very well here in the lab and in the glass house, but have also performed particularly well in, in, in the field in all three countries now. And you can see that in the absence of insects, now there's no insects here in this uh, field trial, and there is no difference in the yield between the non-transgenic and the transgenic. This is very important to show that there is no yield drag associated with the resistance. This is what the plot looked like. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you can see the, the non-transgenic parent line IT86 and one of the transgenic lines over here. And I hope you can see uh, that there are lots of pods on these plants over here and very few pods on the non-transgenic line over here. These plants were all infested artificially uh, every five days with lots of insect uh, uh, maruca larvae. And this is what the seed yield looks like in quantitatively. Again, the three lines shown here, the IT86, the 709 and 252, the two transgenic lines, and again, seed yields in grams per plant here. And you can see that the in the presence of the insects, there's about four grams of seed per plant here, this particular year for the non-transgenic, and about 14 to 18 grams per plant for the, for the two transgenic. That's in a, a field, one of the field trials in Nigeria. The insect pressure was much higher in Burkina, and there was basically no yield at all from the IT86, the non-transgenic line, whereas the, the two transgenic lines were producing uh, 22 to 25 grams per, per plant. So eventually, oh, this is an example of, of just harvested the seed here, all the seed from a, a single plant, showing you what the number of seeds look like, versus the two, all the seeds from one single 709 plant and, and the 252D plant. So you can see there is a very big difference there, uh, visually as well as quantitatively. This is uh, one of the breeders that I mentioned earlier. This is Mohamed Ishiatu, the national breeder for Nigeria. And he's looking here at the plants in the field and deciding which plants, which of the lines that he would like to use as a parent in his breeding program. And the breeders all selected, all selected 709A as the parent that the, the, uh, the line that I mentioned showed here. Uh, they've selected that one as the one that they wanted to go forward with in their breeding program. And they have been producing new now varieties. These are no longer, I'm not, no longer talking about lines. I'm talking about two transgenic varieties. And this is one of those varieties here shown on the right hand side. And a null version of that variety that doesn't have the transgen. And there are very few pods on these plants and plants are still green, like at this stage. That's all of them. That there's nothing, nowhere for their protein to go. But here you can see lots of pods on the transgenic variety. And quantitatively, that's shown here the transgenic variety versus the non the null or the non-transgenic pods per plant, about 20 to versus about four. No pod damage on the transgenic, and 97% of the pods were damaged in the case of the Non the null variety. And the seed weight here is about 30 grams of seed per plant from the transgenic and about five grams per plant from the, the non-transgenic. You see a very big difference in the presence of very high insect infestation. There, while this work has been going on technically here in Australia, there's been a lot of other work being done by other colleagues in, in Africa, and this is an example of farmers being shown the technology. These, these field trials 
have been going on in Nigeria since 2009, and farmers have been gradually uh, allowed to see the plants uh, as as they have been developed in the, as they developed the field. And there's been a lot of uh, interest in them, and the farmers uh, get involved in, in the final stages of the breeding as well. They get to select the best varieties for for potential release. And here's a few, three of 20 farmers who were involved in the breeding program in selecting out the best varieties to go forward. And the first variety has been approved by the regulator in Nigeria. This, we were very pleased to, to get this certificate of, of permit from the regulator, the National Biosafety Management Agency of, of Nigeria. We approved it in the last year, January last year. And that, has, that now has gone forward to variety registration. And the first variety has been uh, approved uh, earlier this year. It's called Sampia 20. This is the logo that they're using. So the, ver the first varieties are now being released in Nigeria, not yet in Burkina Faso or in in Ghana. Ghana is getting quite close. Burkina is a little bit further behind. So I can conclude uh, by saying that one copy line has been selected, very good protection against the bud borer, deals as well as the parent line and the absence of insects. This line has been used as an elite parent for breeding. Uh, and variety development is now complete in Nigeria and continues in Burkina Faso and Ghana at the moment. So the biosafety studies have all been completed to satisfy the regulator in, in Nigeria. In, they're still being completed in Ghana and Burkina. Um, approval for release has been obtained uh, in Nigeria. And in fact, farmers have, are now grown, a select group of farmers have, are growing uh, the BT, the Sampia 20 variety cowpea at the moment, the, the first uh, crops are in the ground in Nigeria. Not, there's not a large number of farms so far, but they are being grown by farmers and they're, they're supervised by the farmers as well themselves. There's still issues, of course, to be resolved. Community acceptance the major, is a major one, uh, not only around the world, as you would be aware, but certainly in Africa as well. We're not, we, we don't know for sure how the community will accept a, a GM crop. All the data that has been collected by the social scientists and economists in, in Nigeria particularly would suggest that there will be quite good acceptance, but we don't know that until, of course, they're offered to the people. The variety uh, approvals are still on the way in, in Burkina and Ghana, as I've said. And uh, issues that still are to be resolved are stewardship and a seed system for dissemination to farmers. As you, as you will re realize, there are many farmers. There's very, these farms are very small. There are very many farms, farmers for these seeds to be disseminated to. And that's still being, well, that is a decision has been made in Nigeria that it will be, the seed will be disseminated by three uh, small seed companies. And they will look after the stewardship. For us here in Australia, we are now transforming with a second gene to the reduced chances of the pod borers developing any resistance. And that, that, that part of the project is, is, is well advanced. Uh, at this stage, we are field trialing lines with the, with that second gene now and cross cross back crossing to the to the first lines with the the one ab gene. I, I, would, I should I should also finish off by by thanking uh, I hope I'm not run too far over time by thanking the people for their help and again I, I just will remind you of the breeders in, in uh, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, very important uh, part of this project. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge Larry Murdoch at Purdue University, an entomologist who uh, was instrumental in getting me involved in this 
through the breeders in, in Africa back in early 2000. So I want to thank my CSRO agriculture and food colleagues and uh, uh, people in entomology who have also helped me at various times um, during critical phases of this project as well. Um, very important to acknowledge the funders, the Rockefeller Foundation, the USAID, and CSRO for funding this work. And also not least, last but not least, the African Agricultural Technology Foundation and Monsanto for access to the BT gene uh, royalty free for, for use in, in Africa. And I would like to thank my immediate colleagues in, in, in uh, CSRO who have really been with me in all of this work for, from the very beginning, Lisa, Stephanie, and Andy. A big thank you to them as well. I'll finish there. Thank you, Joanne. I'll just, I'll just put this, just this last slide up again, just to remind you of some of the things that we still have to do in case people want to ask me any questions about that. Okay, thank, thanks, TJ. Um, that was great. Now, in, people are welcome to ask questions. You have a couple of options. One is to put your question in the Zoom group chat box. You can also put your hand up uh, by opening up the participants box and actually clicking raise your hand, or you can interrupt. <laughs> we'll see how we go. So, are there any questions? Maybe I'll, while you think, I'll ask a question of TJ. TJ, who owns the seed? Because this is obviously um, a, a issue in the developed countries about um, farmers not being able to retain the seed in their crops. Who owns the seed? Well, the seed, uh, normally in Nigeria, it, the, the seed is given to the farmers free. So the seed is owned by the Institute of Agricultural Research because they're the breeders of the cowpeas uh, varieties nationally for Nigeria. And the original intention was that the farmers would be given these seeds free of charge as well in the same way because there is no royalty payable. But in the end, in order to deal with some of the stewardship issues, such as managing the seed, making sure that there is seed available when people want new seed, the decision was made by the Institute of Agricultural Research and AATF, I didn't have any decision making power in this at all, was made by them that they would um, license three seed companies to provide seed to farmers and they will be charged for these seeds, of course. But there is no royalty associated with them. So the seed is still owned by the Institute of Agricultural Research, but the seed will be sold to farmers through the, through the seed company, which will then be uh, responsible for this stewardship and the seed dissemination. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Dixon, and don't forget to unmute yourself, John. Yeah, thanks, uh, TJ. That was great. I like the big picture approach. Um, I had a couple of questions, but the one to start with was what difference big data tools have made to this uh, success with transgenic cowpea in West Africa compared to what might have been done five or ten years ago? So that was the first question. The second one is a totally different one. What's the, what are the niches, the farming system niches in West Africa? going forward for transgenic cowpea versus soybean? Okay, so the first question, your first question about big data, well, when we started this project, which was, probably, was back around 2003, 2004, there was relatively little uh, genomic information, or well, in fact, no genomic information at that stage, basically on cowpea. But of course, the cowpea genome has been sequenced since then, and this has been very helpful. So if, if you'll accept me calling that big data, it is a big, quite a big genome, 620 million bases. Uh, having access to that gene, uh, data has been very helpful for us in dealing with uh, regulatory issues largely, not so much the technical issues for us, here, but in terms of providing information to the regulator about where the gene is and that sort of thing. So big data has come into this in the last 
five years. But in the previous 10 to 15 years, very little, I, 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 would, I would say. Now, your second question was, um, so the, where is GM cowpea going to be in Africa in the future? And that was vis-a-vis -vis -vis soybean. Oh, yes. Well, soybean, it, it started to become quite popular in, in Africa now. When, in the early 2000s, that was not true. But uh, the farmers are looking at soybean as a cash crop, uh, whereas, you know, cowpea is still very much a staple. But there certainly are, I think, farmers who will grow soybeans, whether they grow GM soybeans in the, in the early stages, I'm not so sure, but certainly soybean is, is becoming a very attractive crop to, to farmers in, in Africa. I thought you were also asking about where else in Africa might this be grown and might GM uh, cowpea be grown, but um, the only GM uh, crops grown in Africa at the moment commercially are in Sudan and, and in South Africa. Cotton was grown in Burkina Faso, but isn't at the moment, but I think it will come back. GM cotton will come back in Burkina Faso again uh, shortly, but uh, it, it, it isn't grown there at the moment. Uh, but the only other two countries that are growing commercial GM crops are Sudan and South Africa. But I should say that there are certainly several countries now doing field trials with GM crops. And I, I foresee that there will be quite a few other countries growing GM crops in, in the not too distant future, especially in, in East, Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, perhaps. Okay. So yes, there are quite a few countries looking at the possibilities of using this technology. Thanks, CJ. I've got two questions that have come in, uh, written questions. The first one is from Gupta, who thanks you for your comprehensive presentation. And he wants to know, is the BT expression restricted to flowers and pods? No, the, 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 the BT is, is expressed everywhere in the plant where there are chloroplasts. Mm -hmm. So in stems, uh, petioles, the levels, uh, are fairly high in those uh, tissues as well. There's no expression in the roots. And there is expression in the seeds in the early stages of uh, seed development when the seeds are still green. There's relatively low levels in the mature seed that the protein uh, degrades in the seed as the seed matures. But there is quite a good expression, uh, what we need expression of those in the seed in the early stages to uh, stop the insects. Yeah. Oh, yes, it, the, the gene is controlled by a light regulated gene promoter. So it's not everywhere in the plant, but it is widespread in the plant. And in bad years, these insects eat, eat everything. They eat the PBOs, they eat the stems, everything, but they do prefer the, the pods and seeds. Okay, thank you. And a, a second question uh, comes from Sarinda Singh. Uh, TJ, is there any advantage in developing a marker-free cowpea using CRISPR-Cas9? Well, that, that, that's an interesting question. It, it's not something that has come up in recent times. At the very beginning, uh, when we started this, work, we, we, we did make constructs in which we were trying to remove the selective marker gene by placing it in, in separate tDNAs, et cetera. But that decreased the efficiency of our transformation so much that it was really a problem. But uh, about that time, in our, I think it was 2004 or five, the European Food Safety Authority approved selective marker genes in food systems. So the regulators and ourselves, of course, too, but the regulators in Africa were, became very much more relaxed about having the selective marker genes still present in the plant. And most plants that are out there many of the GM plants do have circular market genes still in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, are there any other questions? If most of you have your videos off, so if you want to ask a question, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. 
Okay, it looks like we've exhausted our questions. So, look, TJ, it's for me to thank you very much for a very interesting talk. As you know, I sort of spent a lot of my research broadly in this area with BT Cotton, so it was fascinating to see the application of that technology for food. Sure, you could see lots of parallels between this project and what you guys have done yeah. in Australia. Yeah. But it's exciting to see it come to fruition and uh, to see it at least being available to farmers and be interesting to see if it is taken up um, by the community that would be a really good outcome i think so. yes this is a food crop uh, you know specifically yeah. a food crop exactly. so it exactly. will it will be interesting to see how yeah performs okay so thank you everybody and thank you thanks tj and thanks for Elvira also for helping out and um i think that's it so we look forward to having you participate in our next talk